Hello. This presentation is titled How to Resect Deeply Infiltrating Endometriosis in the Rectus Sigmoid Colon. I am Cindy Mossbrecher from Gig Harbor, Washington. Still got to figure out how to control my screen here. Sorry. Uh, disclosures, I have nothing to disclose other than this uh, screen background is actually the entrance to the harbor of Gig Harbor proper uh, up here in Washington state. So unfortunately, it doesn't look like that today, but, um, uh, you know, we can only hope for spring. So, uh, this presentation will make a little bit more sense if you watch the frozen pelvis presentation first. Uh, this kind of builds upon that and uh, surgically it makes more sense to address the rectal disease after you address the sidewall disease. Um, and so I recommend that you watch that first. Um, the objectives of this talk are to uh, understand the options for surgical approaches to rectus sigmoid endometriosis, to understand the relevant surgical anatomy, uh, to be able to sec select the appropriate procedure for each patient, to be able to dissect out lesions in order to facilitate low anterior resection by general surgery, and to understand the potential risks and anticipate complications uh, so that you can try to prevent them in the first place rather than uh, fix them after they already happen. So, to begin with, let's look at bow wall anatomy. Uh, this is fairly simple. Most of you probably know this already, but the per pertinent points are that the outer muscularis is longitudinal in late nature and the inner muscularis is circular. And this is important because when you're dissecting on the bow wall, when you're trying to shave off a lesion of endometriosis, it's nice to know how deep you are. And when you see that circular muscle, uh, then you know that you're getting deeper and closer to the uh, submucosa and the mucosa. So that kind of helps tell you where you're at. Uh, I ultrasound everybody and it is part of my uh, surgical planning. And I think that it's very important Uh, in order to help um, with understanding of how to proceed, what types of procedure uh, to do, and how to counsel your patients preoperatively. Um, this image is uh, a beautiful picture of a bow wall. The, uh, the most important part is right here. You will see the muscularis, and it is these dark areas here with the thin white line in between. The muscle is dark, and the potential space between the outer and inner muscularis is this skinny little white line. Um, the submucosa and mucosa uh, are inside of this, and the cirrhosis is obviously outside. This was done in a patient who is bowel prepped. And I can tell you that you will not get this beautiful of an image in somebody who has not been bowel prepped. Um, I ultrasound uh, pretty much everybody who walks into my office at their first consult. Uh, as you can imagine, these people are not prepped. And so uh, my pictures are not quite this pretty, uh, but, they, but they work. Um, this picture is from a pictorial essay of deeply infiltrating endometriosis, uh, which was done by the Brazilians. And I highly recommend that you look at it, especially if you're trying to figure out how to do more uh, of your own ultrasounds. Um, I find that it's very uh, advantageous, not only looking at the bowel wall, but to see how things move, to see if the ovaries are stuck or not. Um, and, um, and so I think it's, it's uh, very beneficial for you to learn how to do your own ultrasounds. Uh, so here's a, um, 
a good reference as far as um, diagnostic accuracy of physical exam, transvaginal ultrasound, uh, rectal endoscopic ultrasound, which some GI docs are doing, but unfortunately not all, uh, as well as MRI uh, to look at deeply infiltrating endometriosis. This is, uh, this first slide is the correlation of physical findings. Uh, so basically physical exam uh, for endometriosis on the uterus sacral ligaments. There's a, about a 74% diagnostic accuracy for endo in the rectovaginal septum. There's about an 86% accuracy and for uh, endometriosis in the intestine, uh, about a 54% accuracy, which is, which is actually better than I thought that it was going to be. Um, because on physical exam, a lot of lesions on the, on the rectum are up too high uh, for you to pick up with uh, your hands. Here is the correlation of transvaginal ultrasound with surgical and pathological findings. And I was a little surprised to see that the sensitivity and specificity here for the intestine are 93 and 100% uh, respectively, uh, which gives it a 95% uh, diagnostic accuracy and 100% uh, positive pr predictive value and 87% negative pr predictive value. Um, which is pretty impressive. Not every study looking at uh, transvaginal ultrasound uh, has numbers quite this high, but most are in the above 90%, uh, typically about 95% range. Uh, rectal endoscopic ultrasound, uh, surprisingly to me, was less sensitive and specific than transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, with about a 5% lower diagnostic accuracy. And then MRI uh, is even less with 80% sensitivity, 93% specificity, and 89% diagnostic accuracy. And the problem that I have with MRI is that um, it's not so much that the imaging doesn't doesn't show the endometriosis. It's that the radiologists don't have enough experience with endometriosis and don't understand endometriosis enough to see it and to recognize it and understand where it is. Um, and so um, I generally, if I'm relying on an MRI to tell me what's going on, I want to see the discs, uh, see the images myself uh, because I've had MRIs being read as completely normal, uh, where the, there's this huge lesion of endometriosis that uh, you can see with, um, um, you know, even me, who I'm, I'm not the best radiologist, but I do know what endometriosis looks like. So here are some pictures of endometriosis on the bowel wall. Uh, this uh, right one is the sagittal plane. And um, the most important thing, I think, uh, to understanding what is truly on the bowel wall and what may be on the posterior cervix or on the vagina is to be able to see a normal thin bowel wall coming into it and leaving it. And uh, when I was a little kid, my neighbors had a boa constrictor and uh, they used to feed it live chickens. And so uh, when I am looking for this, I, uh, I always think of a snake that ate a chicken. Um, on a transverse view, uh, and again, you're not gonna see this view here without a patient who's bowel prepped, but you can see this big, large nodule of endometriosis here within the muscularis. And then you can see the submucosa indented uh, into, the, into the bowel wall. Here are some MRI images. Uh, the top two are T2. The bottom images are FATSAT T1, uh, which are the, the best uh, sequences to look at um, endometriosis. 
Um, here it's uh, about as obvious as the nose on your face. You can see this lesion of endo. Um, the, the edge of it uh, is quite irregular um, and then pushing into the colon to cause these lesions that are called C-shaped lesions uh, because the endometriosis actually causes a lot of fibrosis that pulls the bowel wall into itself and constricts it and kinks it. Uh, here on the coronal images, uh, again, you can see the irregularity of the border with the rectum, uh, especially as compared to the normal uh, thin, smooth rectal wall over here, and then this irregular kind of jagged uh, edge of the endometriosis. So now that we know how to find it and decide uh, decipher how large the lesion is, what do we do with it? So there's basically four main options, uh, really three, uh, for how to address endometriosis of the bowel wall. First is uh, partial thickness discoid resection, also known as shaving. Uh, this is, is feasible and preferable for lesions that are about smaller than two centimeters, uh, kind of depending on how they lie, uh, how much kinking there is of the bowel wall and things like that. Um, it, it is the least invasive and really doesn't change uh, hospital stay at all uh, or recovery. Uh, the next most invasive is the full thickness discoid, which can be done either with a uh, stapler or a hand-sewn technique. Um, I tend to use the, the hand-sewn technique because the uh, discoid um, stapled technique has some limitations, uh, essentially based on the, the diameter of the rectum uh, and being able to get the lesion into the, the jaws of the uh, EEA stapler. Uh, and then finally, segmental resection is either a low anterior resection or an ultra low or sometimes even a, a sigmoid if the nodule is quite high. Um, so how do you decide um, which way to go? Well, um, mostly it's based on the size and the location of the lesion as well as how it lies on the, on the bowel wall. Is it more longitudinal or is it more widthwise? Um, a few years ago, uh, there was uh, quite a vigorous discussion at AAGL uh, by people speaking about the uh, potential complications of segmental resections and how we should be doing more, uh, more shaving and more discoid resections and less segmental resections. Uh, so I thought that I would uh, do a, a very brief literature review before we get into the, uh, the surgical videos. So uh, Dr. Donne and uh, Roman uh, did a nice uh, literature review, basically focusing on the comparison between discoid and segmental resections. Uh, they included um, a number of different articles, uh, which were, um, which were um, series, case series, uh, from different um, locations and put them together and, and uh, compared the uh, shaving technique with a uh, full thickness discoid, um, both hand sewn and, and stapled uh, and low anterior resections. And the, um, the studies that they used uh, to, to come up with these numbers uh, we're kind of all over the map as far as um, how many segmental resections and, and what percentage we're shaving. Um, some of them uh, had up to 70% low anterior resection with only 17% shaving, uh, while others had up to 63% shaving and 37% uh, segmental resections. So uh, ultimately, what they found was that for the shaving technique, 1.7% um, uh, had a entry into the lumen of the colon, 
which was listed under complications. When I attempt to do a shaving and I wind up getting into the lumen, I really don't call it a complication because um, I'm trying to do the least invasive surgery that I can, but sometimes the disease leads you into the, the lumen of the colon. And so if the patient is prepared, uh, counseled, and, um, and it just happens, uh, to me, it's, it's really not a complication. It's, it's just part of the surgery. But at any rate, that happened 1.7% of the time. They had 0.2% uh, of their patients had a late uh, perforation, which was managed either uh, with or without a, a colostomy. 0.25% um, chance of erectovaginal fistula. Um, their uh, recurrence of pain rate was 7.9%, and their reoperation rate was 2.4%. So pretty good numbers overall. Uh, then they looked at the, uh, the full thickness discoid, which as you would expect, had slightly higher rates of rectovaginal fistulas, um, had a higher rate of reoperation of 9.3%, and then a higher rate of pain recurrence at 11%. Um, and then finally, the segmental resections, um, uh, they had... Um, about 1.7% with late uh, perforations, 3.7% uh, with anastomotic leak, 4.3% rate of fistulas, a 5% reoperation rate, and a 17% pain recurrence rate. Um, so um, a little bit more, um, in the way of complications than the discoid. Uh, the other interesting thing that the low anterior resections had that the other techniques did not have was a 5% rate of long-term bladder catheterization. And this is probably much more uh, because the lesions were larger in the low anterior resection group. Uh, as these were not randomized studies, these were case series. And so probably the lesions were larger, which meant that the dis dissection was more lateral into the uh, land of the parasympathetic nerves. So in order to uh, answer the question, uh, which is really the, the question of the hour, are these differences in complication rates due to the surgical technique or are they due to the size and locations of the nodules? So in order to answer that question, um, I tried to find a randomized study, and this was the only one that I could find, uh, by Dr. Roman and his group in France. And uh, so they took 60 patients and they randomized them into uh, discoid resection or low anterior resection. And when you look at the two groups, um, they're... Um, 37% of the uh, conservative group uh, had shaving with no entry into the lumen of the colon. 55% um, had a full thickness discoid excision. And then two of them were converted to uh, segmental resections because the lesions were too large to manage otherwise. Um, three in each group had uh, other bowel resections uh, the nodule size were the same, uh, about three centimeters in both groups. And then um, the uh, height of the, uh, or the distance from the anal verge was about eight and nine centimeters, uh, the lowest being six or seven centimeters, um, which are, are pretty large, pretty low nodules which explains um, uh, when I first read this, I saw this number uh, of about 60% being diverted. And I, uh, my first, first thought was that's a really high number of patients to be diverted. But then I realized that these were very large, very low lesions and it, and it kind of made sense. Uh, so anyways, um, the short-term post-op complications uh, were very similar 
in all groups except for one, which was the uh, stenosis of the lumen uh, after the anastomosis. 15% uh, of the segmental resection uh, had stenosis of the anastomosis. Uh, two of those women had to have a separate uh, resection in order to uh, a surgical procedure to fix the uh, stenosis and three of them had balloon dilation. Um, these were probably all the diverted patients because uh, stenosis happens much more commonly in those uh, patients who are diverted. Uh, but, um, and then at first glance, looking at the bladder atony numbers and the rectovaginal fistula numbers, it looks like they are higher in the conservative group, which wouldn't make any sense. But then one of these uh, uh, patients with bladder atony and one of the ones with rectovaginal fistulas were, um, were one of those patients in the conservative group that were actually uh, treated with a segmental resection. Uh, so it's a little unfair to group them into the uh, conservative group for outcomes. So short-term immediate complications aren't really much different. How about long-term bowel function, uh, which, is, which is what uh, people were really talking about, that, uh, that the rectal storage function is much better uh, when you do a discoid resection. And so uh, two, years, two years later, on average, uh, about, um, they looked at their, um, their standardized questionnaires for bowel function, and uh, the uh, p-value was not dis, uh, significantly different in any group. Um, and then how long were you able to defer defecation? Slightly longer, uh, slightly larger uh, group, more than 15 minutes in the conservative group here at 56% versus 45% in the low anterior resection, but um, not a huge, uh, not a huge difference. And so uh, really to me, what this, uh, what this speaks to is that uh, yes, the differences in outcomes uh, are probably more due to the size of the nodule, the location of the nodule, how high it is above the anal verge, how much of the rectum do you need to remove, how much storage function is, uh, is left, uh, rather than uh, the technique that's used. So, um, I apologize, but I don't have any good videos of uh, a um, anterior discoid stapled technique. Uh, I included a link to Professor Roman's uh, technique that he calls the ruin technique, uh, which you can watch on YouTube. Um, I've done a few of them and when they work, they're great. Uh, the problem is, is, is that um, it's sometimes difficult to get a, uh, the nodule into the stapler and our patients tend to have very small rectums. And so um, in most of the patients who have been uh, a candidate for an anterior discoid that we've tried to do, uh, the rectums are so small that it is um, the 25 stapler, which is the smallest one we have really stretches it out quite a bit. And so, uh, I apologize that, that I don't have a better video. So uh, this first video here um, is a um, shaving. Sorry, I think I have it figured out now. Here we go. Couldn't figure out how to start the video. So this is a rectal shaving. And uh, so we've already got the, uh, the uh, 
lateral sides of the dissection done. We're entering Okabayashi's space here. We're making sure that the nerves are lateral. Uh, I've got a better uh, perirectal space on the left than I do on the right. So I'm going to go ahead and, uh, and uh, exploit that. Um, we're dissecting a little deeper now into the uh, perirectal space and really entering into the rectovaginal septum. Um, most of the time you can get around these lesions even if they're quite deep in the vagina by going uh, down the perirectal spaces uh, and into the um, rectovaginal space and then you can get around the, the bottom end of them. Uh, this is uh, shaving off some of the uh, peritoneum of the cul-de-sac. Uh, you can do these cases with or without a, an EEA in the rectum. Uh, sometimes it's just as easy to do it without, and this one is, uh, is, uh, is that type of a resection. Um, the fat is usually on the sides. The bowel wall will be in, more in the mid midline. Uh, you want to use monopolar cutting current for the bowel wall itself, but you can use coag on the fat as it has a lot more vessels. And uh, here's a little endometrioma in the bowel wall that we want to make sure to get below. And uh, now we're just about below it on the bowel wall itself. We get around it on the fat and then realize that there's just a, a little tiny bit of bowel wall uh, to come through. So then once we, uh, once we go to close it up, we want to inspect and uh, inspect the bowel wall and see exactly where, where we need to put our stitches. Right here is the edge of the dissection and where there is some thermal damage to the bowel wall. So we want to make sure to uh, start our sutures there. Um, again, um, you will be able to see the difference in the orientation of the muscle fibers uh, with the more circular fibers down here running horizontally. And then you can tell the longitudinal fibers, uh, which are the outer muscularis that we wanna to bring together in order to, uh, to make sure that we reconstruct the full thickness of the bowel wall so that there's not a weakness um, that could uh, rupture later. When there's no entry into the lumen of the colon, then there's no increased risk for infection. And uh, I don't keep these people in the hospital any longer than they would otherwise need to stay. So um, I send them home same day. And they, uh, they all really do quite well. So here's, uh, here's the afterwards picture. We did a hysterectomy on this gal. And then the, um, the white substance that you see is fibrin glue. Uh, we spray that uh, when, there's, uh, when there's a large amount of raw surface in the pelvis uh, because it stops the small vessel oozing and helps to uh, reduce the risk of, uh, of adhesions. Uh, this next video is a uh, full thickness discoid. Uh, this was fertility preserving. And uh, so here we're looking at the pelvis and trying to figure out where's the uterosacral ligament. So by looking at this fluffy fat over here uh, and, uh, and then the smooth surface of the retroperitoneum laterally, uh, I realized that uh, the uterosacral is really right in this area. Uh, and that I needed to dissect medial to the uterosacral. Um, here we are using a EEA, uh, which just helps to put more traction on the bowel. Uh, and then uh, we're gonna separate the nodule of endometriosis, which is almost always contiguous from the back of the cervix onto the rectum, sometimes involving the vagina partially or full thickness. Uh, and now we're dissecting uh, the edges of the nodule off of the 
the vagina in the back of the cervix. Here we are um, again uh, exploiting Okabayashi space and uh, getting into that and uh, opening it up. Um, here you can tell that we are in the right spot on the posterior vagina uh, because of the white shiny uh, tissue that tells us uh, that we're not in a whole bunch of fibrosis. Uh, sometimes you will find uh, little endometriomas uh, in, in this part of the world and then you need to make sure that you get underneath them. There's one of them. Uh, and you can see the pink underneath the white, that's the uh, pink of the vagina. Uh, now we come back over to the right side and uh, try to develop uh, Okabayashi's space, which is the, the medial pararectal space. This is some of the uh, cul-de-sac peritoneum that uh, hadn't been taken off before. Uh, so I'm taking this off now. Uh, just trying to, to get all the fibrotic crummy tissue out of the pelvis because it just predisposes to uh, more adhesions. Uh, there's most likely endometriosis within this uh, tissue. And so we want to get it out uh, from an endo and persistent pain standpoint, as well as from a minimizing adhesion standpoint. So now we've got the uh, bowel nodule pretty much freed up from the uh, vagina and we're into the fat of the uh, rectovaginal septum. Now we can elevate the EEA sizer and that will help us figure out where to start our dissection on the bowel wall. Again, we're using monopolar cutting current, uh, which has a lot less thermal spread and uh, does not do damage to the uh, tissue that's left behind. Um, and uh, I'm trying, as I always do, to stay out of the lumen of the colon, but sometimes uh, you just have to, to go in there. Taking uh, excess tissue out. Um, again, there's uh, a lot of pararectal fat on the sides that you can feel free to go through with uh, coag current uh, because otherwise it'll bleed like crazy. Um, and we want to basically minimize how much tissue is adherent to the bowel wall itself uh, by freeing up all the fatty connections to the endometriosis and then we have the smallest possible uh, area to dissect on the muscularis. And now you can see there's a, uh, a lesion that has some depth to it. And uh, originally I was trying to go on top of that, but that didn't work. So uh, once I realized that, then uh, I needed to go underneath it and uh, sometimes this results in going a little deeper than you uh, would like, and you actually get into to the lumen of the colon. Here's the, uh, you can see the transverse fibers there, and there's the beginning of the full thickness perforation. So the important thing when this happens is to uh, ensure that there's no spillage of uh, the fecal contents or at least uh, as much as possible. And uh, so I try to sew these things up as, as quickly as I can. Uh, as soon as the bowel wall is opened, the inner layers with Vicryl, and then the outer layer, you can either use a V-lock or a silk uh, or or a Vicryl if you like. Uh, I tend to use uh, Vicryl uh, followed by silk. For these small defects um, that there's uh, minimal spillage, 
of uh, fecal contents, they, they really heal up quite well. Um, I tend to keep them in the hospital overnight, keep them on clear liquids until they pass gas and then uh, do full liquids for a day and then a, a basically a low residue diet uh, just to not stretch out the, the repair uh, for about a week or so. Here we're bringing the outer muscularis together and uh, imbricating the, the defect and uh, closing over the thin layer uh, where there's only uh, mucosa or uh, intermuscularis. And then this is a uh, continuation of the, uh, the uh, video that I showed in the frozen pelvis section. Um, so we've already got the nodule off of the cervix. And here we're trying to free it up from the pararectal fat. Um, I'm still in the mode of trying to shave this, um, although uh, there's a pretty tight kink right here causing one of those C-shaped lesions uh, where the endometriosis has basically pulled the anterior mesenteric surface together. Uh, and so pretty soon here, um, it's going to be obvious that uh, if we can't get the EEA sizer past the nodule, uh, then it's going to be uh, pretty impossible to um, shave it. And uh, so pretty much right here, I'm making the decision that, yeah, we, we need to do a segmental resection. Uh, shaving isn't going to work because the size hole that we make uh, is going to be about half the size of the size of the hole that we wind up with. And so uh, because of that, um, we go ahead and, uh, and bring in the vessel sealer um, and start the mesenteric dissection. So I'm making the window here uh, and then uh, we put the, the vessel sealer in there and uh, take the mesentery off of the bowel wall. Now, a lot of times I'll do this dissection myself. Uh, my general surgeon uh, usually is operating the same days that I am doing other procedures. And depending on where she's at, uh, if she's still tied up uh, doing another case, then I'll, I'll start the dissection uh, and take the mesentery off, trying to stay as close to the bowel wall as I can. Uh, and then I want to get to, to just past the nodule. Um, and uh, not a lot past it because we want to preserve the rectal blood flow. Sometimes uh, there's more fat down below that you need to take off and the vessel sealer is nice to do that uh, because um, the fat's quite vascular, but you can also do it with a uh, hook and a, and a bipolar uh, or a scissors for those of you who like to use the scissors, I prefer the hook. Um, the more that you can free the, the fat from the distal aspect of the uh, rectum, uh, the more that you can free up the rectum from the tethering that happens from the fibrosis. Uh, and essentially what you're doing is you're, you're raising up the anastomosis to higher up in the pelvis. You're maximizing the uh, size of the rectum that's left over uh, and improving the rectal storage function. So uh, anytime you can, uh, you can do that, that's a good thing.
And then finally, once we're done with our dissection, uh, we give ICG green uh, in order to see what the, what the vascularity is. Um, and you can see that the, uh, the rectum is pretty well vascularized just to immediately underneath the, uh, the nodule. Uh, you need to dissect far enough that you can, you can get the stapler underneath. I apologize for the quality of this video. It's done with a laparoscope, and so the camera isn't quite as stable. Uh, close your eyes if you get motion sickness. So the important thing in this part of the procedure is to uh, make sure you don't get a tuborectal anastomosis. Uh, or a ureterorectal anastomosis and that the uh, distal tips of the stapler are uh, far away from any important structures on the left side. So with the, uh, with the rectum stapled and transected, uh, then we bring the proximal segment out through a small incision we uh, suture the anvil into the uh, sigmoid portion. The EEA sizer goes up the rectum into the uh, uh, rectal stump, and then uh, we bring that through. And connect the anvil uh, and make sure that the uh, sigmoid isn't twisted. Uh, make sure that the uh, mesentery is out of the way so that's not going to get. Uh, trapped in your staple line. And uh, then you close that, um, twist it a little to get it out, and then you do the underwater air pressure test, which I also do for the full thickness uh, discoid resections as well. I just didn't show it in that last video. So you fill up the pelvis with water and you blow some air up the rectum, make sure you don't see any bubbles. Um, that means uh, you don't have any leakage. And so that's a very good thing. Sorry, we're having video problems here. This is my final video for you. It's called a pig in the blanket, which is a uh, technique that Dr. Pai and I have patented. Uh, essentially what it is, is that once we're done with the anastomosis, we take the uh, excess fat in the mesentery or in the uh, pararactyl fat that we've uh, dissected off of the bowel wall. And we mobilize it enough that we can sew it over the top of the anastomosis. And uh, what this does is it basically uh, insulates the anastomosis and uh, protects it. Um, we, started, we started doing this uh, in patients that we did hysterectomies in, uh, in order to um, reduce the risk of uh, rectovaginal fistulas. Uh, I usually sew this in with a V-lock. Um, However, it, it really does work well in lessening the uh, risk of adhesion uh, to the ovaries, to the fallopian tubes, to the sidewalls, uh, to small bowel, uh, because prior to uh, when we started doing this, we would have some patients that uh, we would have to go back in on and they would uh, almost always have adhesions uh, to the anastomosis. Um, and uh, this is just a nice way to uh, essentially insulate the anastomosis in case there is a, a tiny little leak or something, the, the fat can just cover it over and uh, seal it off. And uh, uh, that's the, the way the body protects itself. And, uh, and so we've had uh, quite good success uh, in doing this. Uh, we have reoperated on some of these patients who have who have had the uh, the fat sutured over the anastomosis, and it is just a nice smooth surface in the posterior pelvis. Uh, you don't see the staples, uh, and uh, 
and uh, there's nothing stuck to it. So it's a, a, a very nice thing to do. So uh, this is the end of my presentation. Uh, here are my references. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you to AAGL for having me present. And my apologies for the, uh, for the video hiccups.